following episode most likely contains graphic language, details of violence, and murder, and may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. What is up, everybody? Welcome to episode 50 of Woo! Murder with My Mother, the true crime podcast where I talk murder with my mother. This lady right here. That lady right there. If you guys can't see, she's looking as gorgeous as ever. <laughs> episode 50 for a 50-year-old. Yeah, I was like, again, I can't believe we're at 50. 50 just seems like such a big, large number. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding but no i mean you guys know you guys have been here for the whole ride and if you haven't like go back and listen to all the other episodes yeah. <laughs> right now <laughs> stop this episode and go listen to the other ones um you guys know we and if you don't you're about to find out we like to bring awareness to cases and we love to use our platform for that and we knew that episode 50 is a big a big one um and we wanted to shed some light on a case we're just jumping right into this one. We're jumping. <laughs> we're jumping in it today. Um, we wanted to shed some light on a case that is very. How do you how do you put this? It's, uh, it's really convoluted because it has a lot of different um, branches, mm. and it's it's a strange case, as you'll come to find out. Also, we don't usually do unsolved cases. Mm -hmm. Well, we've done a few unsolved cases. Again, trying to use our platform to help yeah. you know, get them solved, get these cases solved, bring light to these cases. And this case is also uh, close to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, it kind of ranges in places that we have lived and spent time. Uh, it does touch on our other passion, which is the lack of a... Um, justice system in our province yeah. and in our province especially in our country yeah. yes but in our province especially lack of justice yeah so as we've said a million billion trillion times or 50. Uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> maybe actually probably a hundred because probably at least yeah twice in each episode yeah our province is uh known for being a slap on the wrist province and in this case it hasn't even slapped anyone's wrist no it hasn't even gotten close to touching anybody yeah so we are going to uh, cover the case today of the unsolved murder, uh, the 2008 unsolved murder of Lindsay Buziak, who was a real estate agent in Victoria, who was horribly murdered when she was showing a house. So again, this case just screams to me another person who should have been safe at work because yep. you guys remember just a couple episodes ago, we did the Melanie Carpenter case. And again, that case... All that I could see there was somebody at work, a girl, an innocent girl at work was murdered. And it's not even like these people were, like I, I was driving limo for a while and I would show up at like two o'clock in the morning after I dropped all the drunks off in a dark mm -hmm. yard in the middle of nowhere yeah, by myself. And jobs. that you could kind of yeah. expect like maybe something, but... These uh, cases that we're covering are, you know, places where you should be safe. And in the middle of the day, you know, yeah. in the evening, in at five, two, you know, like you'd think that the monsters just lurk in the dark, but we have learned and we are continuing to learn and see that that's not the case. No. So, yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot, and I have to say this, but there's a lot of things. We're obviously going to kind of go over the story and how it's known to the public, but We've been doing our own digging, as you guys know we love to do, and a lot of what we are going to touch on is speculation, um, but it's speculation that is just, it's kind of very obvious. I mean, the way that we think about it, obviously, and we want to, you know, again, respect the the case. The integrity of the, the case, integrity which of isn't the case. really being investigated. No. So, <laughs> I mean... Yeah, again, I like to, and you guys know we like to cover the case as as it's known, and then we kind of do our own, you know, you guys, white guys love us, yeah, yeah, because we are going to dialogue about, you know, what we think and what other people think, and people that are very close to this case, people, the loved ones of Lindsay Buziak, they have their own opinions as well, and I, in my own opinion, I believe that somebody who is that close, I mean, for me, I, I never want to understand what the family of of any of these victims are going through, but being able to 
you know, continue on this fight. And this is almost 15 years that this yeah. has been going on for. She was murdered in 2008. So, I mean, any and parent is going to advocate for their for their child who is murdered. I would just say that prior to investigating this case, like researching this case, like the stuff that we dug up, honestly, while looking into this case was like, holy fuck, like yeah. it was crazy. And then we also have been in close contact with a family member of, mm. of the case. And um, just hearing the things that, that that person had to say and uh, their take on things, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's yeah. open, it's dangerous, it's all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And again, it highlights our lack of justice system that we yeah. do have in British Columbia because a lot of cases here, it does appear that the people who they believe and the people close to the victims believe have perpetrated the attack and the murder they're you know again it's, it's cruising not around getting... living their life like nothing exactly so um as you probably remember from episode one because it was our best episode <laughs> um we touched on how mom and i actually our early roots uh lead back to victoria bc yes so, they do yeah so in 2008 victoria exuded a charming blend of historic elegance and modern vibrancy the city located on vancouver island boasted picturesque landscapes with the Pacific Ocean framing its southern borders. It was also known for its British colonial architecture, lush gardens, and a relaxed coastal atmosphere. They always say, you know, the island, it's everybody drives slow, everybody's yeah. in no rush to get anywhere. It's a beautiful place to live. It's a whole different vibe. So when I was living in Victoria, I was in my early 20s, and the place itself is kind of... Well, they say it's like the newlywed and the nearly dead. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I partied my ass off there. Uh, a lot of probably, babysitters. <laughs> yeah, Danique had a lot of babysitters. I mean, I was probably out like in the nightclub scene, like maybe three nights a week sometimes. Mm -hmm. and but you had also just left a toxic relationship yeah. and you were, you know, a single mom, you were 21, you were living your life. But the nightlife, I remember even <laughs> from my own memories of like how yeah. much fun you would have and how great it was. Well, and, and it, the weird thing is there is it has small town vibes, but it's a city. It's, I mean, it's our recognized, capital city. Yeah, it's our capital city. It's recognized as a city. However, everyone kind of knows each other there. Mm -hmm. And when you're going um, to live a social life there or even working, like when you're working, everything's kind of interconnected. Mm -hmm. You'll see someone at the store that you see later that you're servicing at your job or, or whatever. That you later see at Sweetwater's. Yeah, then you later <laughs> see at Sweetwater's <laughs> nightclub. Yeah. So despite its tranquility... The city was not immune to crime, and that was evidenced in the murder of two thousand in two thousand eight. That uh, the blah, 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 the murder of Lindsay Buziak that took place in February of two thousand eight, and that still to this day continues to cast a shadow over the otherwise idyllic setting. Yeah. So Lindsay Buziak was born on November second, nineteen eighty three, to parents Evelyn and Jeff. She had one sister named Sarah, who she was very close to. Lindsay is often described as a vibrant and ambitious young woman with a promising future. Before her tragic murder in 2008, Lindsay led a successful life in Victoria, BC, where she was born and raised. She was a real estate agent known for her dedication and professionalism in the industry. Lindsay was often characterized as outgoing, friendly, and deeply caring about her loved ones and clients. She had a lot of friends and she had, she was fairly new into being in real estate but she it was about a year yeah but she was doing pretty well like mm -hmm. she she had, had already made a name for herself uh, i think her personality was super well yeah. suited to it and her dad is actually in real and estate. was uh and is still to this day a pretty successful real estate agent mm -hmm. so yeah, I think she just kind of fit right in there. She went to get her degree in business and she then took her realty exam. She was working at a, a pretty uh, prominent real estate firm in Victoria, in Saanich actually, a, a, a suburb, suburb of Victoria. Yeah. In her personal life, Lindsay was surrounded by a supportive network of friends and family. She had aspirations for a fulfilling future and at the time of her murder was in a relationship with a man by the name of Jason Zalo. 
Lindsay's life was marked by her positivity, and she was known to be adventurous and full of life. The events leading up to Lindsay's murder suggest a life that, on the surface, seemed like full of promise and happiness, making her untimely death all the more shocking and tragic. So, like we discussed, obviously, leading up to this, she was a very, she was finding her way, she was finding her ground, and she was doing a good job, too. She was, you know, she was happy with her friends and lived in a city where she was well liked and she had a close relationship with her parents and her sister her family i mean it was a unit right yeah. her parents i think were separated at the time um, yeah they had been divorced since she was a child mm-hmm. she was super well put together too like you see any pictures she was super beautiful oh, yeah always had her very hair professional done. Yes. looking um you can just tell from the photos that you uh would see of her and we'll post them obviously uh yeah she had a lot of uh tenacity and she was vivacious yeah. and she looked she, she looked very outgoing and and really you know on like we said on her way for being mm-hmm. such a young age well and she was recognized for her dedication to her career and the competent the competence she showed in real estate so she kind of just had a natural knack for it and when you do love to talk yeah. to people and <laughs> you know help people with things that is you're helping these people find their homes and hopefully their forever homes right and so when you th- when you think about i think where we were both were at 24 like no way was i spending time on like oh my god i have to get my career together and <laughs> i don't think that was still like 27 28 yeah, I think you know? mine was 49 yeah. like it was like <laughs> it was last very, year yeah like really t- for such a young age she was extremely well put together mm-hmm. so on a personal level more personal than her personal connections um lindsay like we said she was in a relationship with someone named jason zalo and their connection was a significant part of her life adding a personal dimension to her otherwise professional pursuits because not only was jason her boyfriend jason's mother was also her boss yeah so lindsay was known to be outgoing caring and someone who cherished her relationships with friends and family And as her real estate career flourished, Lindsay appeared to be on a path of growth and fulfillment. Like, that's literally all you see. Every single thing you look at, every interview you hear, people are saying how much she loved where she was, what she was doing. And, I mean, there were parts of her life that we will discuss, you know, as the episode goes, that maybe on the surface seemed perfect like we always see especially with social media right the day we live in the time we live in well yeah especially now yeah especially and this was just starting to take off around that time right so i mean you never put out i mean people do people put fucking you know like the worst (laughs) shit you could ever put on facebook but you know everybody around her that was just seeing Lindsay. you know she's on a great career path she has a happy relationship and it was all snatched away and you know that's the thing so the on the day of february 2nd 2008 lindsay and jason so actually a couple days before lindsay had received a call so she was showing multi-million dollar homes she was showing i mean it's not hard here you could show like a two bedroom <laughs> well, now. now you could show yeah like you know, a trap house but down back the road then it was you know yeah. when you're working in a profession and you're showing like the best of the best and your clientele is you know a different part of society and i'm sure she helped everybody but she received a call a couple days before her murder that kind of made her from all accounts yeah, made her all accounts. you know kind of nervous gave her a bad energy gave her a bad feeling so she received a call from a woman and she actually jotted the number down with all the details you know she was clearly very uh, she gave attention to details yeah so Lindsay received a call and it was from a woman and the woman had very specific um, things that she was looking for in a home she had very very um, you know, had to be this many bedrooms. It has to be move-in ready. It has to be. It had this to have size. a spot for a housekeeper in it. Yeah. So and, you know, very yeah. very specific. And the woman also had a strange accent that she couldn't quite place. Mm-hmm. She said it sounded kind of Spanish, but she couldn't really place the accent. Yeah. So Lindsay actually kind of went on referring because these it was so mysterious. The really mysterious part was that the person actually contacted Lindsay directly on her cell phone, which was not on any of the, you know, um, real estate posters uh, from her agency. It wasn't, 
it, that was not the number that was given. It was the office's number. Yeah. Right. And so she asked, how did you, you know, how did, how did you, you get, get my number? My number? Yeah. And the woman had said she got it from a previous client of Lindsay's. And gave Lindsay the name. Which Lindsay tried to double check, but that person happened to be out of town at the time. So she wasn't able to confirm. And that's the thing about this case. There's a lot of coincidences. Yeah, and you lot. guys know by my voice when I just said that. I'm air quoting. Because there are a lot of coincidences in this case. So... The morning of, um, I mean, I think that she had touched base with her dad and said, you know, I, I'm nerve, I'm, I'm got a weird feeling about this. She had told a lot of people. She had told her dad. Her dad then said to her, uh, "Make sure someone goes with mm -hmm. you." Um, she had told several people that day, or the day before, in her office. Um, she was supposed to be coming over to Vancouver f that day on the Saturday to go to a friend's. I think bridal shower or stag at party, but she put it off because these people that had called her, they wanted to spend a million dollars on this mm, house. And think about that. And back in those days, a million dollars bought a lot more than it does now. Mm -hmm. So she stood to gain a huge commission, but she still, she let that override her gut feeling. Mm -hmm. So she had spoken to several people in the, people in the office. She spoke to uh, her boss, her mother-in-law about... Shirley Zalo, yeah. Yeah, so then eventually her boyfriend had agreed that he would go with her. Yeah, for a peace of mind, yeah. right? According like to... 6'4", yeah. 240, 240, you know, like he's a big dude. So obviously yeah. if I'm somebody's parent, which I am, but if, you know, if, <laughs> if, if <laughs> they're... Not. Yeah, no. Um, but if they're telling me this, oh, I'm going to go do this and I feel unsafe, I would say, you know, yeah. like with you, if I were like, I have Monica and Alexis with me, I'm like, Monica's pretty tough, she's small, but you know, it's it's just the fact that somebody's going to be there with you just to make sure everything goes smoothly. So as a dad or as any parent, yeah. hearing your big boyfriend who used to be, I'm pretty sure, a hockey player, you know. Yeah, he, I think he still was at that yeah, time. Yeah, he's a big guy. So that yeah. would give you peace of mind. And, and she had said at least to her dad, for sure. Oh no, Jason's coming with me. Mm -hmm. So everyone felt, and I think she even felt like, okay, good. Like I really want the money from the sale of this house yeah. if it sells, but I also don't feel safe going there by myself. Well, and how many times do you have that feeling and ignore it? Because again, if someone is going to be there with you, if somebody yeah. is, it's your workplace, you know, how, and if there's no reason for you to have anything to worry about, well, and you why feel would kinda, you? You also... I find anyway, like, <laughs> for instance, I went to go buy winter tires or summer tires for my car and I went to someone's house off marketplace and I was just having this communication with a man and I brought a knife in my pocket and then I felt afterwards like it was like a nice yeah. elderly man and I was like, oh my God, imagine if he knew I had a knife in my pocket, but yeah. I had just had a weird feeling. I didn't feel like it was not a safe thing for me to go and do by myself. Drop your pin and I'll always know where you are. Yeah, but. like, I mean, he could have taken my knife and overpowered me. But again, if I even, in today's, with today's technology, I couldn't keep you safe from just a pin. Yes, I would know where you were, yeah. but that's not the, in this situation, they know where she is. It's yeah. not like she is somewhere that she's not supposed to be. She's at work. And she, and everyone that she spoke to knew where she was going to mm -hmm. be. Like the address of the house she was showing. Yeah. So earlier that day, her and Jason went for something to eat at a local spot. And, you know, the plan was that he was going to quickly go do something, you know, run a quick errand. I think, yeah, I think that changed. Probably right in, before. Right before. Like, I think they went for lunch and then he was like, oh, shit, I forgot I had to do something. I'll meet you there. Mm -hmm. So on the way there so she they went their separate ways she went to the house and was you know getting everything ready or you know waiting for her clients to arrive and after doing an errand like we said jason actually picked up a friend and pulled up to wait outside in his car while lindsay entered the property with the client so lindsay was already there when he arrived he had texted her about 10 to 15 minutes before he arrived saying that I'll, I'll see you soon. I'll be there in 10 to 15 minutes. And she replied to him and said, they're here. The Mexicans are here, she said. Yeah. So at 538, Jason texted he was only a couple minutes away. And this text was never opened. So there is a there was a lockbox um, on the property. And it has, you know, a time. It's basically 
Um, yeah, it's a box where the keys to the house yes, are. Yes, but it, it allows you to know what time, it, you can see the log, you know, what time people yeah. took the keys. So at 529, the lock box was opened. And then again, like I said, Jason had texted her, but he, that message was never opened. It was never read. At 541, Lindsay's phone had placed a call to a friend that she didn't really speak to, I don't think very regularly. Um, and the call went unanswered and she left a voicemail. But it was a pocket dial. It was a pocket dial and, you know, it was kind of just like you could hear background noise. You couldn't hear too much. It was mostly rustling and, and things like that. So the events of the fateful day became the focal point of a high profile and ongoing investigation. And so basically what happened was Lindsay was there. Jason arrived but as he arrived he said that he saw somebody coming out of the door but quickly shut the door and returned inside so he assumed as he says that he thinks that he thought that they had just got there even though she had texted him At how many yes saying they're here or the mexicans are here so jason as from jason's account he, him and his friend now great that he has his friend there because his friend is you know, another person who can be there to see what's going to happen. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to just, you know, tell you guys the story as we know and as we've been told. This is the story by as everyone it has involved, come out. right? So Jason sees this and then just continues to wait in his car. Instead of going in, and he says that the reason he did not go in is because he didn't want to come across as the overbearing boyfriend or controlling boyfriend. Yeah. And which... so he waited on that street for a couple minutes and then he actually went, moved his truck to this next street over and parked for for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So again, after Lindsay not returning his text message, not opening it, not anything, not coming out, Jason and his friend now decide, okay, we're going to go and we're going to check it out. So they try to open the door and it was locked. So, it was about 40 minutes. Like, yeah. It was but, a long time that they sat in the truck. So the friend went around the back of the house and saw that the, the French doors in the back had been left opened. And so he went in, opened the front door, and Jason, as he explains it, he entered the home and he ran as fast as he could upstairs right into the master bedroom where he discovered Lindsay's lifeless body and she had been stabbed over 40 times. Yeah. Basically, she had been, you know, she had been, like, the word Slaved. is slaughtered. Yeah, I mean, yeah. really, you know, and I hate to use that word, but that is the reality of this case. So they, Jason, when he first got to the front door, when they first went to check out the house, the front door was locked and he could see Lindsay's shoes on the stairs. So he, when no one was answering, he made his initial call to 911 saying my girlfriend was showing a house, she's not answering, the door is locked, I can see her shoes. Then he boosted his friend over the fence to the backyard. The other guy went in and then they called, when they found Lindsay's body, they called 911 again. Mm -hmm. So the police were already on their way from the first call, so they got there very quickly. Mm -hmm. And Jason and his friend were standing in the um, upstairs window in the window that the, of the master bedroom where Lindsay was murdered, uh, waving their arms at the police. Yeah. So the attack in, uh, occurred inside the property. Can I say the address? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. At one seven zero two DeSousa Place. So again, within minutes, obviously it ha it had become apparent to police that Lindsay was targeted for some reason, and the way that police come to these you know, that's what they know is because usually, and, and this it does happen. I mean, there are random attacks and we watching true crime, you see, you know, if you're watching any kind of, if sometimes on YouTube, you know, Dateline plays, majority of the time it's a woman. And yeah. a lot of the time, I mean, a lot of the time it's one person, but a lot of the time it's, it, it's random. It is rare. It's yeah. more rare, but a lot, there, it, that does happen, you know, and most of the motives behind Things like that are robbery, sexual assaults, which we see all the time. Yeah. Um, but there was nothing of that in this case. And that is what pointed police to 
to say that they know this atar- this attack, this atar- a targeted attack, that's my new word, I guess. Uh, this attack had been targeted, and Lindsay was the target of this attack. Well, yes. Nothing was stolen. She was not sexually assaulted. Um, they took they took Jason right away because it, it all kind of looked like too convenient. They mm-hmm. took him and his friend in, into custody right away. Uh, and then after that, they started to do, you know, the tracing, the investigation. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact that they found out that the phone that was used uh, to contact her each time was a burner phone that had come from Vancouver. Mm-hmm. It was bought at a store just off of Davies Street in Vancouver. And it was not activated until shortly before they called, like right when they started calling her. But it was it was purchased in November. So it was purchased quite a ways before she was murdered. Which shows, I mean, that could be one of two things because most of the time the people who are buying these burner phones are not just buying one. Yeah. They're buying a, a bunch of them and they use them when the time is convenient for them to use these phones. Obviously, most of the time, it's things that they don't want traced. Yeah. So murder, number one thing, that's the worst crime you can commit is taking somebody's life. Obviously, you're going to want to use something, but that does show some kind of you know, Pre-planning. forethought. Exactly. And the only number that was ever called from that phone was Lindsay's phone number. Mm-hmm. The phone was activated um, over here on the mainland, and then it shows the phone traveling the night before over to Victoria and they know where the phone stayed overnight Mm -hmm. and after Lindsay's murder the phone was never used again yeah and so obviously you know police are going to canvas the area the house is not telling them a whole lot um the people who had scheduled this appointment were not known to Lindsay they were not known and Jason did not get a good description of what these people looked like but there was a neighbor in the area that did see Lindsay outside the home with a couple. So right away, as soon as this came to light, they released a picture of the dress. It was a very colorful dress. And the woman apparently had shoulder length, short blonde hair with a tall Caucasian man. Both well-dressed. Both well-dressed, which, yeah. So that's all the police really knew. And the dress, was like multicolored with um, like bright colors going down the front of it. And when you think about something that flashy, which we can post a, post a picture of the dress, um, it's distracting. Like mm-hmm. you're going to be drawn to that dress. That was very well thought out. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be looking so much at the person wearing the dress yeah. as you are at like, whoa. Yeah, it's a, what kind of fucking dress a is that? It's a loud dress. <laughs> Brought it at Abuelita's favorite yeah. store. Yeah, Zara. Yeah. No, no Zara's good. What was it like called? That oh, Bellissimo. Be- Bellissimo, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Bellissimo. Sorry, Zara. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so also Lindsay's lack of familiarity with these people, that again in itself, red flag. Yeah. The fact that they had so many specific things and this and that, red flag. The home itself, who it was owned by at the time, Red flag, neon, neon flag. So law enforcement responded promptly to the crime scene, like we discussed, and initiated an investigation that aimed to piece together the sequence of events leading up to Lindsay's murder. The challenging circumstances of the crime scene made it difficult to establish a clear motive or identity of any suspect in the investigation. The initial findings underscored the complexity of Lindsay's murder, prompting ongoing efforts by investigators to unravel the mystery and bring those responsible to justice. You guys probably sense a tone in my voice, but so as you know, just by the fact that Jason had his friend with him and was seen somewhere else on camera, on camera. Uh, well, he's obviously not there while the killing is happening. Exactly, which is very, very coincidental and convenient, right? But I mean, so there are, obviously they have to rule out other things out, right? So they kind of, they look into Lindsay's life. They see, you know, everyone close to her. We don't even fucking know her. And I can tell you just from, you know, looking at her and seeing people in her life, she was on the right path. She was... You know, she wasn't associating with people that were dangerous. She wasn't living a high-risk lifestyle. Again, none of those things are reasons to be murdered, but they will put you 
at maybe more of a risk, right? More even though, even though in in a town such a small place, you mm-hmm. you by association do know 100%. some of those people. A hundred percent. And that's the thing too. When you say people, you know, they were known to this person, they were known to that person. You, when you grow up with somebody and like you touched on, you know, you're serving a person and then you're partying with them later and then you're yeah. at church with them the next day. I mean, not you, but you know, like people, you know, and it's, yeah. it's so interconnected because it, it is so small. The whole Island is fucking small. Yeah. It's big. It's large. It's vast, but like not really. You know, you can be like, oh, do you know, that's person from Port McNeil. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, yeah, my cousin in Nanaimo in Parksville. <laughs> you know, it's it's not big. And so to say you, she knew people and people who were nefarious and yeah. people who are dealing drugs and people who are probably, we yeah. all fucking know people like that. I that, don't. Yeah, no, not you at all. You're a little saint over there, <laughs> 50-year-old saint. But it's it's without goes without saying like everybody knows someone that they just because they know them or they have went to elementary school then when you're born and you raised in a place like I have lived it's not anywhere (laughs) I'm not gonna give my address or anything but I've lived in a general vicinity of somewhere since I was what seven yeah and I there's I know way too many people and a lot of the time when something happens you're like oh you know you can you know that person, but that doesn't mean that you have these really close connections with someone. And even if you do have a close connection with somebody and they're living a part of a life, that doesn't mean you're necessarily involved or, you know, deserve anything like that no, that's going to happen mean, to you. No one deserves that. Definitely not. So now we come down to, okay, what is the motive? Exactly. And that, to solve a case, you have to know why this person was yeah. targeted. We've talked about cases where... It's very obvious who the perpetrator is, but that perpetrator, it's because of the things that that person has done. Rhymes with or, lion. Oh yeah. But you know. Justice for Trina. <laughs> Justice for Trina. Hashtag Justice for Trina. But do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's very like, okay, you didn't help look. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. You know, there's no pictures or CCTV of you anywhere to show that you did not. But, but, but the number one suspect. By, yeah, the closest person to you is generally yeah usually your partner right so and now with that they said that they had cleared him well and 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 leading up to clearing him the police took him back there and you can find this video on youtube so leading leading to before they cleared him the police actually went with jason Mm -hmm. zalo to the address i think it was three or four days after the murder and you can see on YouTube that he's he's being very descriptive with like, I just opened the front door. As soon as my friend opened the front door, I just ran right up the stairs. First of all, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone because I'm not trying to get sued. But he, how would you know in a house with mm-hmm. uh, two Probably floors, a bedrooms. million dollar house, <laughs> yeah. how would you know to instantly go up the stairs is that just a lucky guess? And directly into the place where you're... Especially since he has never been in the house. Yeah. And another thing, too, is Jason actually did mortgage broke. Like, he's a mortgage yeah. broker, and he did real estate. So majority of the time, he was there, or he was dealing with the same clients that Lindsay was. Yeah. So the fact that he was like, oh, I'll just wait out here because I don't want to seem like da 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 It's like, no, yeah. if you're really worried and you know the the worry that your girlfriend is can, has expressed, well, the first concern, of all, you don't show up late. Second no. of all, you don't go somewhere where you're going to be seen on camera. And then, and then pick up your friend, just happen to pick up your friend. All of this, again, is very, very It's not, I mean, he's been cleared. He's been but, cleared. But the thing is, they said he took a polygraph. But they will not say he passed a polygraph. They say that him and his mother took one. But they have not said they they have they have basically what the police is saying is they have what they need for right now. That's not saying that it's what they need is for them to be, you know, pass this polygraph. Maybe what they needed is for them to not pass the polygraph. Who knows? Obviously, there hasn't been a whole lot of movement because it's been 15 years. And also when you see he's he's been very very um i mean his emotion level when he's going through the reenactment there's none it's like 
a hockey game like oh and then I passed the puck here and then I did yeah. this and then I did that and but he's talking about his girlfriend of a year's murder mm. brutal murder where he found the body yeah she was in a relationship uh f- a six-year relationship before that and that guy can't even speak without f- uh, Lindsay's dad said twice he's seen him like fall off of a chair in tears because he's so 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 mm. upset which I mean everyone does react to trauma differently yeah However, I don't know that after finding someone that I loved uh, stabbed to death, I would be able to just be like, and then I did this and then I did that. I don't know. I hope I never have to find that out. But no, and I do know someone, I know a couple people who have had, you know, similar situations, finding the person they love deceased in any manner yeah. is traumatizing. You know, there's people who I know relatives of ours where it's like they can't even talk about it without their eyes you know even the thought of the person's name the mention instantly you can see it affecting them so the fact that you walked in and found your girlfriend murdered I knew exactly where she was and then three days later you're like I can go do a reenactment like just for me and I and again everybody's different everybody reacts to trauma different everybody reacts to everyone's grief and the levels of grief and the the different layers of grief they're going to be different for everybody. Yeah. But fake it a little. Like, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> I don't know. Even with the, with the other case that we've covered. Really? Like, you're just going to, oh, well, you know, pick up and move on. Like, it just doesn't sit well with us. And then, so they did that and they knew that he had, you know, his alibi. He was cleared. Uh, but then they started kind of branching out to different things like first of all I want to say that the day before Lindsay was murdered all of the top investigators in Victoria had just happened to retire Mm -hmm. was that a coincidence or was that something that was planned exactly well if you knew and maybe someone close to the family or someone that lived in a small town that knew a lot of stuff exactly or maybe was dating one of those people yeah that retired which again we're not trying to get sued but (laughs) there's facts right there's facts there's shit that is is deep and it's not even that deep we were able to find it and again i mean a lot of the podcasts that jeff has been on jeff buziak the father he is very out with who he thinks and he who he knows in his heart is what he says yeah that who did maybe didn't actually do the murder, like was not the murderer, yeah. physical murderer, but putting a plan into action, maybe not in our country, but doing that, like we've seen with Jennifer Pan, you know, if you're orchestrating a murder, y- you are the murderer. You are the reason that this murder took place. You know, all the inner workings and all of the different parts of the machine, you are the motor. You are the person that's running it. You know, you're the fuel. You're the you're all the things. I'm not going to go into all my mechanic knowledge, but, you know, you are the part that's keeping this, this making this happen. Well, it wouldn't have happened, yeah, without you. No. So it, it, the investigation stalled right from the start. The yeah. police just were kind of like, well, well, you know, like they did ask for uh, the public's help. Mm-hmm. But the main crusader of, of this case has been Lindsay's father, Jeff Buziak. Yeah. Uh, each year on the date of her murder, he starts a march uh, in in Victoria. Now, he doesn't live in Victoria, but he goes back and mm-hmm. he 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 has a march where they they carry signs, they they march in awareness for finding justice for Lindsay. Well, and. I actually had the pleasure of speaking with Jeff, and he's very open to telling you anything you want to know. Yeah. Um, I think he is obviously a little guarded because there has been recent um, lawsuits against him. Um, I mean, that also makes me feel a little guarded. Of just, course, yeah. Just with, like, I'm not going to sit here and and uh, spew out stuff. I don't know the facts of the case enough yes. to... Of course, but again, on the on just the surface, you can see that the police work been a little shifty yeah. we're used to seeing that especially in Canada yeah. protecting the criminal and you know the person who is suing him is someone who he has publicly said I believe this person has had something to do with my daughter's murder yeah. so you're right? gonna sue the victim's well father? and the criminal justice system is going to allow you to sue the victim's father yeah so another thing too about Jeff is he had mentioned that uh in December of 2000 Seven, I guess it would have been just a couple months before, but 
um, because she was murdered in February, she was over. So it was just six weeks, I think, before her murder. Yeah. She went to Calgary to visit her dad. And she, like we said, despite how things appeared on the surface, the people who are closest to her, number one being her dad, I think she talked to her dad very frequently. Yeah, they he lived like had a like, very open relationship. Yes. And she told him basically that Jason was controlling, overbearing, jealous, and <laughs> all accounts of his mother are like... She didn't seem like a really nice lady. I don't know if you can get sued for saying that. (laughs) You know, it's my, just from gathering what people have said and, you know, obviously, okay, I love comments, especially on like, like different feeds like Reddit and all that stuff. The shit that people say, Instagram even, the comments on there is where you get all the juicy stuff. So if you're going through those comments, you can see people talking about their character talking about you know you you see you kind of get a pretty good idea of what kind of person yeah the mother is right so again we obviously i mean i don't even think the police know what the fuck's going on but obviously from doing our armed armchair investigative <laughs> reporting we know that something is amiss a something is there's too many coincidences there's too many things that do not add up and I mean this has been Jeff's life since the day that this happened Mm -hmm. he has gone through making a lot of connections doing a lot of digging he's pissed a lot of people off oh yeah but I'm sorry yeah I I don't care if someone did something to you and this is why he does it he does it for future victims of crime and he realizes that Mm -hmm. there is a huge gap in our justice system as do we yes so there's a commonality there and i'm sure a lot of people realize that that at this point yeah well and again that is despite these extensive efforts extensive um Lindsay's murder remains unsolved which highlights the complexities and challenges associated with this case yeah when somebody is targeted and i mean Again, going back to the way she was murdered, if it was, because there has been all these conspiracies, right? And I mean, some of them are conspiracy, some of them are, you know, not, I don't think. So there has been everything from, you know, oh, she, she ratted on this drug cartel and there, because, because shortly after she left Calgary, uh, there was a large drug bust in Calgary and she actually had a personal connection to a family member of some, one of the per like yeah. persons that was arrested in that case there's but okay i've watched enough cartel documentaries if a cartel is going to come to town first of all they're not going to come do you know how many drugs they lose in a year that's part of the business the business model you're going to leave i mean i don't know yeah. that exact business model <laughs> but any business you you know there's a loss and when you're yeah. dealing in illegal drugs and you know getting them here getting them there you, 80 kilos of cocaine is not that big of a number. That's not. It's not in the in the big grand scheme yeah. of things. They're not going to go hire these people, make sure she has all of this stuff where the home was, have a personal connection, yeah. where, you know, the burner phone that they bought in Vancouver months before. This is somebody who has a very close... Yeah connection to Lindsay. Someone that's going to know how to push her buttons in order to make her go to that spot and disregard her gut feelings. Exactly. So yeah, she, there's, there's other conspiracies, right? Again, the thing where, oh, she knew people who were drug dealers. She hung out with drug dealers. According to Jeff, she did not like drug dealers. You know, she again was on a good path. She wasn't, she wasn't even really a big party girl. You know, she was, I mean, she partied like I think yeah. average for her age, yeah. but she was she was like yeah, very grown up for her age. Yeah. Um. And also, I think just the fact that there was so much that led to everything falling together does really show that it was all interwoven. Yeah. Even the amount of stab wounds inflicted on Lindsay that. Is not if if a cartel or someone like that is gonna you think they're gonna shoot you in the back of the head right? Do you think that they're gonna come in, play these roles, set you up? No. And if it was, they're not gonna come up here to kill one person, especially not some young woman 
some who, realtor some realtor who because of the word on the street was Lindsay had ratted on this drug operation Lindsay, in from all accounts even from the police she was not yeah she was not involved she was not an informant she wasn't involved at all maybe she went to fucking elementary school with one of these kids' cousin or something like that yeah it but was that's it like that. Because she had contacted the cousin of someone or a family member of someone. I'm not sure of the exact specific family member. But while she was in Calgary over Facebook Messenger or whatever. Yeah, I think it was like a kid she went to school with. Yeah, which if you're in, I mean, titty boy, Anthony, (laughs) when I go to Kelowna to visit my grandparents before, right? He's one of our big listeners. But, you know, I would, yeah, okay, I don't shoot the shit with him all the time. But when I'm there, hey, let's hook up. Let's smoke a doobie. Let's do yeah. something, you know, let's do whatever and catch up. And then, you know, you return to your life. But the fact that she told her dad that she was in an unhappy relationship, that the mother, you know, was, I don't think she was very happy with her as a boss either. Well, the dad got a taste of the mother when he went to visit Lindsay for the first time. And he, he says, like, she was blatantly rude swearing at him like their first meeting yeah and jeff just from our you know two conversations that we had you you know he's a no bullshit kind of guy yeah he's not afraid to tell you to fuck off (laughs) and he's not afraid to try to advocate for his daughter right for her memory and he tried to you know he said to me multiple times you know Lindsay is gone Lindsay is dead this yes i would love to have and i won't stop until the day i die i will not stop trying to get to get justice for her but really at the end of the day she is already gone you know what he's doing this for and this kind of comes back to what we love to talk about mostly me is the fact that our justice system caters to the criminals it is the criminal justice for justice for criminal system yeah that's what it is it always has been in this country but the fact that now people who he suspect are able to sue him people who he yeah and he's being treated like the criminal at this well point. even for him to have to constantly watch his back because if somebody yeah. is going to and whether this be actual what's going on or just your thought because how traumatic would it be that your daughter was murdered in that way if something like that happened to you I would constantly be worried that something was going to happen to me just because if it could happen to you and now you're speaking out about it but he doesn't care because he just wants justice for his daughter and now it's steered off into a direction where he wants to protect, like he, his quote, he said, this is for you, this is for your mom, this is for the women and the people who are still in our communities who need to be protected because criminals will kill you and then no you know, one will do anything about no it. No one will do anything about it. And if they do, they'll go to jail or they'll be sentenced to life and they'll get out in eight years. Yeah. So, I mean, I thought it was very interesting because I didn't really know. I know, obviously, again, what we know as the general public about this case. Once you do the deep dive and you're fucking, you know, there's so many different things. But when you really can kind of get the smoke and mirrors out of there, you see the clear. I mean, you guys all, I always want you guys to do your own research on these cases. I think that that's part of it is we like to bring it to you guys so you can look and form your own opinion. And also um, if we want to create awareness because somebody out there knows something, like they might've heard, uh, who knows? Like you might've been at a party one night and you heard something, like every little thing. You never know what you know until- No, you never know know we bring awareness to it. Yeah. And there is, there's a petition, for justice for for Lindsay, for them to start looking, you know, more at it. There's a website called uh, Lindsay Buziak Murder dot com. Mm-hmm. There is um, Jeff's Facebook page. There is a lot of stuff that can still be done with this mm-hmm. with this case, and we wanted to bring a rare awareness so that hopefully uh, we can help out in some way to get. Get, get some people held accountable and get some answers. Yeah, and the emotional impact of her death, it really resonated with not just Victoria and the community, but everybody. I mean, yeah. they did a Dateline special on this. Yeah. I think Jeff was on Dr. Phil. He was. Um, and again, he's not going to say exactly what he is thinking because, because he's not protected in this country. The people who are p- protected are the people who he thinks have perpetrated this murder 
So Lindsay's family and friends actively advocate for justice. They speak out whenever they can. The dad is does the walk for Lindsay every, I believe it's February, February yeah. right? On the day of her murder. And there's been events, there's been vigils, there's been memorials. There's a lot of things, and I mean, I credit a lot of it to Jeff and the family, right? Yeah. The sister, the mom, everyone keeping her, her friends. It looks like she had a great friend circle, you know? Keeping her memory alive and trying to really... Because those, all those people or someone who did this probably is still in that vicinity. And it's been 15 oh, yeah. years, yeah, yeah. right? There was a video that I saw on TikTok. So, I mean, obviously, what do, what do we know about TikTok? It's not the most reliable source. But a friend of Lindsay's, um, a while after the murder, she received a call in the middle of the night. And it was the same voice that Lindsay had described, the same accent that Lindsay had described the Mexicans, right? Yeah. And... The friend called the number back like 30 times. They wouldn't answer. Called it back finally. And who answered the phone? We don't know who it was. It was a woman who maybe gave birth to a guy who might have been dating Lindsay. We don't know. Yeah. But how crazy is that? So I think um, we are going to try to go a little further with, uh, you know, like you never know what's going to come up with this mm -hmm. one. Yeah, we hope and that it's going to be solved. We yeah, hope for we justice. Hope. And a lot of members of our community, uh, of community of, of Canada in a whole, even America, everywhere. I mean, people are expressing their frustration and their their impatience with the lack of the movement on the case. And I mean, really, it's very disappointing, not just for the family, but for everyone who wants to see justice for this case. It's not, it's not, doesn't appear to be on the horizon. I hope I'm wrong. Um, but there is a lot of shifty characters with this whole, even in the police force. There's obviously I'm not going to name any names again because I'm not trying to get sued. I can't afford that. I don't really have anything if you sue me. So no, yeah, you'll just get mom's <laughs> dog, um, uh, and you don't want him. He costs sheds a more lot. Than he's worth. Yeah. <laughs> um, but even as we're watching Dateline, mom's like, "Oh my god, that cop used to hit on me at Sweetwaters, and he was the biggest fucking creep ever." Yeah, so and it's like, definitely. Yeah. So yeah. you see this, and again, with knowing that the people, you know, people were retiring the night before, and so how many investigators are going to be on the case? Do they have maybe, you know, speaking on this person's character, if you're in the bar and you're in, in your creepy, giving everybody the heebs, yeah. that speaks to who you are as a person. That speaks to your character. So... A lot of other episodes or podcasts have been done about this case. Jeff, like we said, he's not afraid to say what he thinks. And there was an article written um, basically bashing the hell out of Jeff, saying that he is controlling, he is all these things. Paranoid. Paranoid. Crazy. He's, yeah. He doesn't come across that way. At all. At all. No. And he's very, he, he has a background in psychology. He said to me, you know, the first thing I did when Lindsay was murdered was I set myself up for some counseling and therapy. And, you know, there's so many people who don't even know. I said, I'm so proud of you for doing that. And I'm proud of you for fighting for your daughter and her memory and the justice. And he said, again, I'm not fighting for her. I'm fighting for you. I'm fighting for the people who still remain in our community. And that's what we're fighting for also. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's why I thought that's the our interconnection. Why. Exactly. It is our why. And that's why I really, once we dug into this and once I spoke with Jeff and I, I explained to him, you know, this is where murder with my mother. This is kind of what we highlight or what we talk about and he right away said that's his main focus is the lack of justice that criminals ever face so so i just want to say that november the 2nd is uh should have been Lindsay's 40th birthday yes and actually if you guys are listening on the day this is released then it is november 2nd so happy birthday Lindsay, happy heavenly birthday. And we really, I mean, we encourage all of you guys, every listener, every watcher to be vigilant and share any information. You know, you never know what you could know or what someone you know could know or any of that. And <clears throat> I mean, not that they've been overly helpful, but if you have any information, you can contact the Saanich Police Department at one 250 Four seven five four three two one, and you may also consider contacting Crime Stompers anonymously if you wish to provide any information without revealing your identity. Um, that's always a good number to have. So the phone number for Crime Stompers is 
Crime Stoppers, not Crime Stompers, sorry, is 1-800-222-TIPS, which is 8477. So Someone knows something, and it's been it's been a lot of years now. Maybe your life has changed yeah. since you had knowledge of this. Maybe you're looking to get right, and mm-hmm. I encourage you to call in. Yeah, and if you don't have, you know, if you, maybe you didn't even think of something that you saw, or maybe you were in the area, maybe you... You know, you heard something at the bar or wherever. Maybe you were friends of a friend of a friend yeah. who got drunk one night and talked about something they shouldn't have. A little more than drinking if you're probably talking about that. But exactly, right? So, I mean, that's basically at the end of the day. We want justice for Lindsay. We want justice for Lindsay's family. And we want justice for our country. And we want the justice system to... Take accountability. Yeah, take accountability and keep criminals where they belong. Keep criminals behind bars. That's all. That's it. (laughs) So we obviously, 50 is a lot. So we hope. 50 is young. Come on. 50 is really young. We got a lot more left in us. (laughs) We do. But (laughs) um, yeah, again, this case just yells at you, you know. Let's bring justice home. Yeah. And for all of us yeah. because yeah this is for Lindsay, but it's for all of us and like jeff said you know it's it is to keep our future generations safe and you know i have a daughter she's going to be two in 20 years she's going to be 22 and she you know Lindsay was only 24 when she was murdered that's not she was just starting her life and such a promising life and i mean i think she made you know choices in her life and uh, Sadly, it led her... She didn't even make any wrong choices. No, not wrong ones, just choices, right? And it's just sometimes when things transpire and, you know, you're on one side of things and other people are on another side and they see you as a threat, I think that that's usually what happens, right? And so watch where you work and watch who you date. That's all I'm going to say. That's probably the theme of, of this whole everything. Yeah. Really those two things. Watch where you work. (laughs) Watch where you work. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for listening and watching. Thank you, yes. And uh, we'll see you for episode 51. In six months. No, just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) But, yes, so that was Murder With My Mother, the true crime podcast where I talk murder with my mother. Bye, guys. Bye.